Welcome to Athenaeum. I'm Robert. I'm Jake. And I'm Sam. Welcome to a conversation about writing, literature, and the culture that feeds them. So what are we talking about today? We are talking about uh, retellings, our thoughts on them, and also um, we've got a couple examples of some modern retellings. Mm. And actually, the one, the area we're going to start with, which has really interesting mythology, is um, Russia. And I think the Russian story that a lot of the world knows or has at least heard of is um, Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga. Yes, especially recently Baba. since it was featured in John Wick. That's right. It was. <laughs> <laughs> they so. call him Baba Yaga. He's the old man with, with pain. <laughs> oh, almost there, Rob. <laughs> Um, so kind of like the basic idea of Baba Yaga, and actually um, another place where least people who grew up with the, oh, uh, who is, what's the name of those, the series that um, Kiki, the delivery girl, is by, the, an the anime movies. Oh, um, Hayato Miyazaki. Yes, Miyazaki movies. Um, in, I think it's Howl's Moving Castle, they have a witch that I think is actually mm. based on Baba Yaga. Yes. So, um, yeah, because Baba Yaga <coughs> is a supernatural being, on occasion a tri trio of sisters of the same name, who appears as a deformed or ferocious-looking old woman. In Russian folklore, Baba Yaga flies around in a motor, mortar, wheels <laughs> a yeah, pestle and dwells deep in the forest in a hut usually described as standing on chicken legs. Mm. So mortar and pestle where you have the um, those very thick ceramic bowls that people would use to grind down. So that's what the yep. <laughs> that's what she's got. Hmm. So um, classic witch hunt. She she wields that, huh? Yes. She like a sword. <laughs> where I. Most of the times I've seen it, she like uses it as an oar or a paddle in the air. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how it is that Baba Yaga ended up becoming like a default Russian folklore. I do know that a lot of the traditional Russian folklore has actually been lost. Mm. Um, back in the oh, I think it was. It was like the 1200s when uh, Christianity came to Russia. They, right. they very much suppressed those traditional stories. Um, yeah, ba Baba, um, <laughs> Baba Yaga is definitely the more common known. Uh, the book, though, that I think does a great job with a good portion of Russian folklore, and it is actually a great introduction to into not only fr Russian folklore, but the time period where um, it was disappearing is the Bear and the Nightingale. Mm. Um, mm. And so it's... The <laughs> we both did the... I haven't read that, but I should have. <laughs> so... Um, is that what Mahum meant? Mahum meant... <laughs> hmm. There's not a whole lot of thoughts that go into my hmm. Mm, typical Rob. Please, please continue. <laughs> uh, so it's uh, The Bear and the Nightingale is the first in the Winter Night trilogy by Catherine Arding. And uh, one of the things I do like about this novel is that even though it's the first in a trilogy, and, and this might have a lot more to do with... Um, I don't think, Kath I think Catherine Arden is an American author, if I remember correctly, but she captured, uh, yeah, she's definitely an American, um, but she, she really captured the feel of a lot of Russian style of writing, which is nice, um, and 
when you read the first novel, even though there are more, because it's told in that very traditional storytelling method of gather around, we will tell you a tale. Mm. Even though there's a few threads left open, it feels very bookended. And then you go on to the next book and you realize, oh yeah, that's right. They mentioned this and this and this. Um, but The Bear and the Nightingale brings together a lot of the known Russian tales. So you have Baba Yaga. You also have um, Father Frost, which um, in this book, he's referred to uh, as uh, the uh, winter demon, I believe, is the other um, way he's referred to. Hmm. Uh, and Father Frost is um, has a tale associated with him. Uh, kind of think Cinderella and the evil stepmother, but the father is still there. Um, mm. So the premise of it is that you have this girl, this very, very sweet girl, whose mother died shortly after she was born. And when she gets to be older, the father decides he needs to remarry. So he marries a woman who brings in, um, and then she has another daughter who's a couple, just a couple of years younger than our main character. And as they grow, the stepmother just hates the first daughter. And um, at one point, she talks her husband into taking the first daughter out into the forest in the middle of winter and leaving her there as a quote-unquote bride for Father Frost. And Father Frost comes up to her while she's in the forest, and she's getting colder and colder. And he asks her, um, you know, are you, are you cold? What, um, hmm. Oh, that's what it is. Um, are you comfortable, sweet child? <laughs> And she replies, indeed I am. And then she keeps getting colder, and he asks again, are you still uncomfortable? Yes, yes, I am. Um, and it gets to the point where she has charmed him so much through the, her um, gentle and kind nature that he decides, all right, you know, you're a decent, you're, you're a sweet girl. Here are all of these jewels and finery, take them back, and you now have a fantastic dowry to go along with you. Hmm. Um, it's also implied, at least in um, the, the uh, Bear and the Nightingale, that uh, in that story, other things happen. It's not just because she's nice, but you know, he kind of ah. takes her as a uh, bride, if you would. <laughs> Very rushed. And then she goes. Oh. So yeah, she, she goes back to her father. You know, they find out the father goes out in the morning to go retrieve her dead body. And oh my God, my daughter's still here. And she has all these riches. Oh my. And so <laughs> they bring her back. And the stepmother's like, oh, well, my daughter, if, if the first one got this much, my daughter, who's so much better, will get even more. Well, her daughter's spoiled rotten. So the father takes the second daughter out, leaves her there. Mm. And when... Father Frost asks the same question. She's like, of course I'm cold. I'm not comfortable. Ba, 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 ba. And he ends up, you know, freezing her to death <laughs> because she wasn't kind and polite as yeah. any good wife should be. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> that sounds girl, like don't a... complain about being cold or yeah. dying of cold. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a, a mixture of a few different uh, retellings of folk tales that I've read. There's there's one in particular which uh, a man gets lost in the woods and um, some mythical creature takes care of him and takes him into his home. And then as he's leaving him, he offers him a gift of a small basket with something in it or a large basket with something in it. And the man, being humble and kind, takes a small basket and returns and finds that it's full of gems and treasure. And then his, his uh, greedy... Uh, half brother or something like this goes out in the woods and purposely gets lost and mistreats the hospitality of this creature when he finds it and then when he's offered the choice he takes a large bowl and it's full of snakes and toads and cockroaches yes. 
So oh, I think I've read a few that oh. have that kind of message of you know be be humble and and not greedy and and kind and stuff. Yeah, that's what Little Red Riding Hood was about. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> I was I was ready for you to make your case. <laughs> he was no, uh, L- Little Red Riding Hood was really. Uh... <laughs> oh, has has his connection dropped? Maybe is he gonna burst in again? Again. Um, well, his his thing is lighting up. Yes. Uh, there we oh, go. Yep. Hello? Hello. There we oh, go. good. We can hear you now. Much That's better. Good. So, <laughs> I, I asked, what was Hansel and Gretel about? Uh, oh, he, don't trust Hansel witches. and Gretel. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was Don't Trust Witches. Um, but it was also being clever and not just... I think the the... the idea behind that is don't just trust someone because they appear to be nice to you Mm. (laughs) um and and i think in in the end modern day has parents will often inadvertently um set up situations or not set up but describe situations similar to Hansel and Gretel when they're talking about their kids of don't talk to a stranger, you know, don't talk to someone just because they offer you candy. Don't get in someone's van because they offer <laughs> you a bike. Um, yeah. I think Hansel and Gretel, probably when it comes to the grim fairy tales, inadvertently is one of the more um, uh, more relatable tales. Hmm. Not not because there are witches with, you know, yeah. <laughs> houses made of gingerbread, but <laughs> more so that, hey, you know, don't trust strangers. Um, I've, <laughs> I've actually thought in the past that uh, Goldilocks, at least the way it's told these days, is a pretty well-constructed story at the very least. Maybe the messages aren't as useful, but uh, just the, the, the idea of the repetition creating a pattern which the the child can fig has the opportunity to figure out uh and uh, the kind of the escalation of the conflict and yeah. and and of course the most important message which is that bears are people too and you you should be nice <laughs> to them <laughs> oh, uh, uh, well, true. And, uh, i mean uh, yeah there's there's tons of stories that feature something unusual happening in a in a forested area. Yeah. Um, especially if we start looking at the le- I don't want to say lesser known. Lesser known to me. <laughs> um, non mainstream, maybe. Yeah. You know, if you start looking at like uh, um, pretty much any. <laughs> Any area that has woods will have a a, a folklore Mm. about what's in those woods. You know, you start looking at um, even just uh, monsters. Typically, the monsters have some kind of story behind them. It's not just like, oh, there's a a monster in those woods. It's like, um, oh, there's a monster in that woods that, you know, he came about because long ago a king, you know, (laughs) I don't know. Classic. Disrespected an enemy and then buried him in a shallow grave. And the enemy came back as a monster for revenge. And now okay. anybody who speaks that king's name risks getting eaten by the monster. Hmm. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. The way so the way you just like, said you know, it, with how it's all it's places near forests have it, <clears throat> made me think that a better modern equivalent to folk tales might actually, ironically, be sci-fi since space and like the the frontier of knowledge is the new scary interesting place that we want to tell stories about that is an interesting idea uh, <laughs> and i think that there's some validity to it <laughs> you'd hope so 
Don't be, you... don't be smart. Don't be freshy with me, please. <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. I, I, I'm happy to have it picked apart. I can't with that on the spot, so. I think oh, is that what that what noise makes... was? Yeah, that's what that noise was. <laughs> I'm the Sam whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I think where I disagree is that kind of what makes a folk tale a folk tale is the idea that this could happen to you. Like even because hmm. right when when a lot of the folk tales were written, um, magic to some extent was believed to be real. Like they, there was some hint of. You know, this could happen to you. Uh, I think if we were actually in space, you could say that space folktales would be a thing. But I, I, I don't quite think that space yet has the accessibility for space tales to be um, a thing. Now, alien invasions or whatever, yeah, yeah you could... <laughs> you could maybe, maybe make the argument for that, but I, yeah. I don't think things take place in space. Yeah, no, you're you're right. They're obviously the, uh, not a one-to-one -one comparison, but I think some of the important elements are carried over in the genre, which is interesting to think about since they're yeah. quite opposite in most ways. Go ahead, Rob. So I think that lots of stories from those, you know, those folklore folk tale times you kind of just realize that they're they're all based upon maybe some kind of half truth but mm -hmm. like a whole lot of ignorance basically uh, <laughs> it, it's really just the fact that either whoever came up with the story didn't see what they actually saw you know they saw you know a, a deer in the woods right they said, oh my god i just came across this wendigo you know uh <laughs> Or it's just everybody else, probably, that has a bigger thing to do with it, is that the people who are hearing this story don't actually know what's happening, and they probably don't want to go and find out. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of the problem that you run into uh, when you talk about, are there any modern folk tales? It's just because we live in such an age that it is, it is really hard to be that ignorant that you don't yeah. know what's in I, the woods I think, I think modern folk tales would include um, uh, Bloody Mary, I would definitely argue, is a modern folk tale because it is based on um, a historical figure. Actually, a really good version of a modern folk tale is um, Santa Claus. Santa Claus is a very, as he is today, is a very new idea. Mm. It was made by a... Um, cartoonist, I believe, in, like, 1883. Hmm. Um, it's a, and so, just a collection of things that made him popular, right? Like, first, yeah, there was yeah, the saint, yeah. then there were a few cartoonists. Hadn't actually heard about that one. And everyone knows the Coca-Cola thing. <laughs> yeah, no, um, the modern... Uh, making sure I've got the date right. Actually, is attributed to a specific person. Yeah. Um, for what makes what we view the current Santa Claus as. Um, trying to remember his name. Uh, it was Saint Nicholas, right? Uh, yeah, no, I meant I meant the guy who did the, oh, the original. Oh, the Yeah, the. Okay. Artist. Oh. Well. Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. 1823. Uh, the night before Christmas was written and published, and then um. Yeah. So Clement Moore is the guy that I've heard that people will give credit. So. Ah, Thomas Nass. That's who it is. 1863, not 1883. Thomas Nass is kind of credited for cementing what we currently think of 
as where he created the idea of Santa Claus lives in the North Pole and he's this jolly fellow and um, kind of he created the very modern idea of what and who Santa Claus is. Mm. So he kind of like cemented that in the American culture at least. Right. Um, but it, it is interesting when you try and find like modern folktale examples. Uh, what, what you come up with is kids books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um which I I think the the bloody mary and the the ghost stories kind of thing are probably the most similar mm -hmm. uh, modern examples that we have. Yeah. And yeah. Although well, you know. Yeah. To a lesser to a lesser degree. I think that uh ghost stories will serve that same function oh. just because ghost stories have the believe ability that uh folk tales had <laughs> however there's no there's no like one ghost you know there's no like yeah. that lives in you know this particular house that everybody knows to stay away from that house yeah. i mean usually people if you believe in ghosts you probably think they could be anywhere I've I've heard a lot of different experts recently talking about how they think we exaggerate the ignorance that people had in the past. So, oh, yeah. Because yeah. I, I imagine it's probably more similar to how we, most folktales are probably more similar to how we enjoy ghost stories than an actual, like, belief about what's happening. Well, Although it's, I, like the, it's probably a lot closer. Go ahead. It's like the idea that, um, you know, when Christopher Columbus sailed the seven seas, uh, <laughs> um, that, you know, the idea of the world being round was a unique thing. It wasn't. No. Um, that was a, the, you know, commonly accepted thing. Flat Earth wasn't a thing very often. No, because um, the, the people who would have thought of or considered it being flat were the kind of people who weren't wouldn't just just wouldn't think about it anyway. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Like, um, you you do see that in some um, myth lore. I think Native American myth has something about yeah. you know seeing the ends of the world. But that, that you know that's the more common thing is it in the yep. folklore or the mythology. Yeah. Um, but well, yeah, I, I think that we definitely try and make historical folks ancient. You know, civilizations uh, quite a bit dumber than they actually were. I mean, they did live and survive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the, that's not yeah. as easy as uh, as you know. I would say modern day living significantly easier than it was then. Yes, definitely. And they their methods for gaining knowledge were different. Like <sighs> they use tradition and experience, whereas we use things like the scientific method and data gathering and stuff like that. Oh, I, I know, um, you know, a lot of, I think, the modern folktale examples, you really <laughs> mm -hmm. just have to look at, like, American folk folklore. Yeah. Like, Paul Bunyan, um, and, uh, oh, the, why am I blanking? The Headless Horseman of, um, well, the Headless Horseman folk story yeah yes uh the headless horseman of something hollow <laughs> that that's putting me in mind of arthurian sleepy hollow legends. here we go sleepy hollow um well and like i think the headless horseman is a good one of those examples of oh historically it's based in the idea that you know a hessian soldier who came to the u.s or what was then, you know, the colonies mm. to fight in, I think it was the French and Indian War is what they had him over there for. And he, you know, was this terrible, or this fearsome fighter. And finally, someone beheaded him <laughs> and, you know, ended, you know, put an end to the terror. But actually, he still comes back to life in the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery looking for his head. 
because they didn't bury her with him. <laughs> um, which is a very, very oversimplification of that story, but it is a good story. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but, but yeah, it's there. I think American folklore is probably examples. Of, I think really all of that is generally considered modern folk tales. Yes. Well, by definition, yeah. the youth of the country. <laughs> yeah. So Paul Bunyan. I suppose you probably have never, uh, Rob. Have you ever heard of the tale of Paul Bunyan? I've heard of it. Um, okay. The name does I'm sound familiar, but I don't know what the story is. Overly familiar with it, though. Um, Paul Bunyan was supposed to be a giant man with his giant blue ox, Abe, who um, felled the trees in Minnesota, and he was so big, and he traveled so much that the reason that Minnesota has over a thousand lakes is because those lakes are his footsteps. You know what, I think <laughs> I've, I've read a kind of a, a, a retelling of that of some sort, maybe with a different name. Yeah. yeah. yeah you, the other one that I can think of is Johnny Appleseed, who traveled yes. the East Coast and, you know, accidentally planted, accidentally planted all of these apple trees. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but back to Russian folklore. Yes. There, the Nightingale. Um, it's just a really good example of uh, the whole breadth of Russian folklore. Beyond Baba Yaga and Father Frost, they also have Firebird. Um, the I think one of the most interesting things about Russian folklore that has survived is um, I'm probably going to butcher this. Um, mm. Domovoy. Domovoy, which um, are thought as, I think the loosest translation is um, house spirits or house demons. So right. the idea is that every house is protected by one of these creatures and that you feed them and you kind of like, you know, give offerings to them and the happier they were, the better they would protect your home and bring more luck. It's probably cats, right? <laughs> <laughs> They were really cats the whole time, <laughs> the whole time. They just had invisible cats in Russia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I, there just isn't a whole lot of Russian folklore, like the actual what they would have heard back then that survived, which is just too bad. Yeah. What the? Um, the, the first place I remember hearing about Baba Yaga was in a Tashi story. You, either of you heard of Tashi? No. I've heard of it. I don't mm. know what it is. Oh, it's just a, a series of, of children's books that are quite fun and, and quite interesting, but they, most of them are kind of derived from some sort of folklore from different countries. So there's there's one with a magic carpet, there's uh, there's all these kind of things. There's a, a royal tomb with uh, the statues in them, Ooh. ghosts, there's a manticore, all the stuff, all the stuff. Manticore. It's just uh, so, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. That that reminds me of a conversation that I had with someone, and they asked me. What's the difference between folk tales and mythology? Mm. And, uh, um, folk, so mythology is usually built around a larger mythos. Um, and I think the other thing, too, is that mythology, um, they're things that they worshipped. Yes. Um, it's in the same as universe as the, the gods. <laughs> Well, for example, in Greek, uh, quote unquote, mythology, they have a lot of monsters, right? Lots of monsters that we still know about today. For example, we'll just use the uh, Minotaur. Mm -hmm. So nobody worships the Minotaur. 
and it, it, it wasn't a deific sort of being. Rather, it was just like everything else that they thought. It was a, a creature that had been influenced by their deity. Yeah, but so. But I think the deity bit is is what make is the difference is that there was a deity involved. Yeah. Okay. Well, All let's right. say in like Native American folklore, they have their spirits that they worship and that do everything around them. So should we call that Native American mythology? Potentially. <laughs> I think. Um, uh, I was going to say another distinction that could be made, but I'm, I'm not sure about it anymore, was that uh, the folk oh tales gosh, could be guys, said. There's a, yeah? There's a giant spider, like, slowly <laughs> making its way towards me. It is huge. Yeah? Oh, God. Oh, oh no, it's moved. Ah. <laughs> Get the cat. You sound like you're not away. going to kill it. Well, I got really close and then yeah, it moved. Okay, we're just gonna hope it stays over in its little corner. <laughs> Kill that spider. I'd have to unhook I'd have to take my headphones off. That's too much work. <laughs> well I hope you don't die of spider bite. Mm. Yeah. Well, um I think I think the other reason why um, Native American doesn't traditionally have or we don't talk about them in the essence of mythology is because every tribe had their own. Yeah. It wasn't one cohesive idea. Like there are a few yeah. things that are common across it, like coyote and a few other um, things. Like they would have the same theme between their stories, but they it didn't. If anything, the the mythos of Native Americans is um, like earth, water, the seasons. Yeah. And then the elements. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. Do you know a lot about Native Americans? Nope. Jake? Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like um, like uh, the mythos and Native American is usually considered like the great spirit is considered part of their mythos. Mm. Um, uh, uh, and well, then, yeah, you have like Buffalo, the sun. Um, but yeah, they don't necessarily have a well-known mythos, I think, because a lot of their stuff just fits into the folklore better, where it's a, it's generally tales about the people. It's not you know, very human tales. Oh, that spider's huge. <laughs> oh, God. Well, I don't know so, if it's the same over there, but here, generally, the larger the spider is, the less dangerous it is. The, the small no, ones are the I, ones I, I that are poisonous. Because mm -mm. oh, mm -mm. we don't really have like tarantulas every everywhere. Right, yeah. Tarantulas like a big spider for us. exception, I guess. Yeah. A big spider for us could honestly be like a third of the size of a tarantula. That spider's huge. <laughs> but it could still have, you know. Um, how, how big is it, Sam? Like hand sized, finger sized? Like. Uh, like. Um, bigger than a quarter, like, probably, hold on, so inch a, and a half in diameter. A large coin, okay. Yes, a that, large coin. Because here in Australia, we have huntsman spiders that are pretty common, and they're like roughly the size of your hand, and that's what we yeah, call a big spider. What you're, what you're looking at would be called a small spider here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I will be right back, I'm going to go. Um, I'll take That's care of the spider. Tough. Very well. <laughs> so, just to continue the discussion. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sure that there is an actual uh, distinction that gets made between folklore and mythology. You know, I'm going to Google it. In the way that I... Can Go you ahead. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. What did you say? I said I'm going to Google it while you're talking. Oh. Uh... uh where I draw the, the line in my own sort of thinking, and this is what I said to this person. Uh, Got it. <laughs> Good yeah. job. Congrats. That didn't take very long. <laughs> They're like, oh, that's 
too much work to get up and go kill it. Mm. And he did it in like 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Bro. So where I make the distinction in my mind is just that when I think of mythology, I mean, yes, I think of, you know, gods and creation stories and mm -hmm. uh, to, to some extent also talking about the lives of like notable persons and stuff like that. Mm. But I mean, when you have mythology, there's that idea of history to me. Yeah. Whereas with folklore, a lot of times that's something that is still going on in people's minds. It's not mm. like, um, I mean, you, you can have someone say, oh, there was a witch in those woods 50 years ago. And ever since we don't go in those woods because maybe the witch is still there. Yeah. You could say like, oh, yeah, this happened in the past. But I think with folk tales, the idea is that it's still going on. Whereas with mythology, there's that idea of history behind it. Like at some well, vague point in history, you know, Theseus killed the Minotaur. Well, you have you, you also have the idea to witness that um, it the other big thing, like Jake was saying earlier, folk tales frequently were not they were not widely accepted as the truth. Whereas mythos is accepted as the truth. And then another bit about the time is that when you think about most myths, they they aren't cemented to a time. It's either they happen, you know, before humanity was around, they happened outside of humanity. Um, mm. It may have interacted with humans, but the, um, like the actual time wasn't really super well defined. Like a uh, Greek and Roman myth, they do involve specific people, but those specific people, or yeah, they're, they're not defined as having lived at this precise time. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, I just had a look and a definition I found quickly that seems fairly good is that uh, myth is considered, uh, myths are in this context are sacred, whereas folklore is kind of flexible and, uh, you know, adaptable. Yeah, adaptable. Let's say. So I, yeah. I would, I would say, but the way I would say it is that it's not necessarily that they're believed to be true. It's, I would say, it's uh, bad to tell. You you can tell a myth wrong, whereas you can only tell a folk tale better or worse, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got what you're saying. So, uh, I think that that would probably so, be a nice, e easy distinction. Go ahead. Would you guys say that those sort of um, those sorts of things all, in my mind, they come from the same desire of mm. basically one wanting to figure something out and Two, wanting to relate that. So mm. you kind of, in that, you, you have the, the core concept of a story. You have a conflict. Something something is going on that uh, I need to figure out. Yes. And two, you have a narrative. Here's what I did to figure out this conflict. And yeah. then maybe you get a resolution uh, if it's a... <laughs> If it's a story that lasted, you probably did get a resolution. <laughs> well, so yeah, in my mind, that's kind of that's kind of where all of this has come from because we know now that darn near every myth, darn near every folk folk tale, is just I mean patently wrong. It's just not something that actually exists. Well, it's arguably arguably the more, more important part of the definition of the word these days of myth is something that is not true. Well, where did that come from? You know, that came from everybody believed it for so long. <laughs> and then we find out, now that we get science, we find out that it was all lies. Mm. <laughs> so it's just like, oh, that's just a myth. That's just a fable, you know. Whereas those words once meant, you know, a, a I, more genuine version of their same meaning now. I, I do wonder how many myths were considered to be like, 
literal truths at the time and how many we've just kind of, we just believe we're like that. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah. I do think it's safe to say that probably most Greek and Roman mythologies were considered to be true. Just because we do really? have, we do just have so much evidence that this stuff is everywhere. Like, it's like they really yeah. believed it. Whereas, um, well, I'm not super familiar with a whole lot of other mythology. So I can't <laughs> really say. <laughs> I think in Chinese mythology as well. Yeah, um, well, the Chinese um, rulers were generally considered to have been descendants yeah. of. Um, and the other, the other one where you can say they had a lot of influence over the people is like Norse mythology, and um, Germ uh, the Germanic um, mythology, which is kind of close-ish to um, to Norse. Um, uh, but we've definitely gotten slightly off track of uh, retellings. We Ooh, have retellings. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> So, Rob, do you remember any retellings that you've read of stories? Do I remember any retellings? Yeah. Because uh, before, yes, I do, Jake. Before we started, I, I didn't think I had any, but every time Sam's mentioned a story, I've I realized that one of these anthology books that I've read has had some version of it or other, or another. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. Um. <laughs> yes, I, I've read. <laughs> Go ahead. I've read Go lots ahead. of mythological retellings. Yeah. I had this. Uh, that's actually like how I how I learned about them is this big like children's version collection of Greek mythology. Mm, yes. Which is why you hear me talk about like that more than anything else is because uh, I read that when I was a kid and it was yep. so cool to me that I I just stuck with it. And I've always been interested in that particular type of uh, fiction. Yeah, and um, that's why Percy Jackson's popular, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's I, a cool world. I, I am proud to say that I found Percy Jackson before it was cool. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was hipster. That was quite Maybe a while ago. Take that! Bunch of bandwagoners around. <laughs> I was one of the originals, you know. Um, no, I, I did actually enjoy Percy Jackson. Um, but Excellent. talking specifically about like retellings, I can't remember the names, but I read this big anthology. And this yeah. is how I learned about um, like the fates. This yep. is how I learned about um, the muses. I learned about uh, Aerith, gods mm -hmm. of discord. I learned about Atlas, who holds up the world. And I, I can't give you any specific elements, but I, I will say that what it seems like in that, from that book and mm. from every other retelling, is that typically you want to make your retelling happier. Uh, because lots of these original stories are just, they're so unsatisfying because they're so dark and like grim. And mm. it's just like, well, why did I read that? Like, now well, I like feel like crap. Now my take, day is take, objectively worse. <laughs> take Hercules, where in, in the original myth of Hercules, oh. he kills his three daughters. Yes, it's so, who came up with this story? It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hated Hera. After I learned the truth of that, I hated Hera with a passion. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and then you have her in the Disney version gets <laughs> all the praise. <laughs> Oh, yeah. the poor mother. Like, no, she's <laughs> the one who sent the snakes. <laughs> or, you know, poor Hades in that movie, even though, you know, like, in the actual movie, Hades is a fantastic character. But when you look at Greek men, <laughs> Hades gets the short end of every stick. And oh, he, like, yeah. was yeah. not a bad person. Well, he literally got the short end of a stick, I think. <laughs> they yep. drew straws, didn't they, to decide who would become the god yeah. of what? Yep. And he drew like the shortest one. <laughs> yeah. He's just the unlucky I'm son. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking it up, but Hercules' is actual name, Heracles. Yeah. yeah, it's ironic. It means pride of Hera. 
<laughs> which is, it's funny if you don't know Jake because um, Hercules is not actually Hera's son. No. Yep. The, and I mean, it ends up playing in, right, because I think his wife, or maybe it wasn't his wife, there's like one of the um, women involved in the Hercules telling human women's women. <laughs> <laughs> Woman. thought he, um, based on his name, thought he was the um, current hero on behalf of Hera and had Hera's blessing. Right. So that ends up playing a, a bit into his story, too, which mm. is, is ironic in all of the ways. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, one of what I find interesting is, like, um, the myth of so myths, um, Norse myths, Greek myths, um, all of those have a lot of modern day examples. Like they're very popular to go to. Um, but then when you go to um, folklore, you have a few examples like you know, um, like the Bear and the Nightingale, and then when it comes to like German versions, spinning silver, uh, and a couple other ones. Like, what is Naomi, nah, Naomi Novik does some retellings that are very interesting and, and truly are the retellings where they take the original story and twist it quite a bit. Um, mm. But, uh, oh, that's what I was going to say. Uh, but when it comes to a lot of the other mythos, and, and, and here's where I think the Indian, from like, India, Indian retellings. Um, I think they're, they are probably very, very common in India, but there's just not a lot of examples in the Western world of Indian retellings. But then you get to Native American retellings, and we try and find modern, you know, modern books that involve the Native American mytho or uh, folk tales. They're all urban fantasy novels. Like, <laughs> yeah. All of them. Um, you've got the um, Alpha and Omega series by Patricia Briggs, as well as Mercy Thompson series, where um, the Mercy Thompson series, spoilers, <laughs> spoiler alerts for anyone who has not read the Mercy Thompson series. Um, to cl you know, cover your ears for a couple seconds, is the fact that the main character, Mercy Thompson, is the daughter of Coyote. Mm. Uh, and so and then Alpha and Omega uh, the husband in Alpha and Omega is half Native American and grew up in the early 1800s being raised at least partially by his uh, grandfather on the Native American side um, so they, they, they end up being very involved and then there's a whole series called the Walker Papers by C.E. Murphy where mm. um, it is all, almost all, a combination of Native American mythos. Again, coyote is involved, um, snake, horse, um, <laughs> as well as the idea of dream walking in the Native American sense. Um, it, and then how it melds with Celtic uh, folklore, which Celtic folklore is super interesting and, you know, yeah. pretty much any of your more traditional idea of fae and elves and all of that. Like, a lot of the fantasy stuff that we consider fantasy is based in Celtic folklore. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They are very creative people, the Irish. They are. It's cold and wet. You got to get creative, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> My, could make a joke that it's because of the alcohol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, no, when you try and find, you know, um, Native American retellings, they are all, pretty much all urban fantasy novels, and I'm trying to, I've, I've got a list here, trying to see if any, any of them are not urban fantasy, and... <laughs> no. Oh, here's a, yeah, <laughs> here's a couple, but actually they're just the, the um, actual legends in paperback form so <laughs> okay okay so where do 
where do you guys draw the line between uh, retelling and an adaptation? Um, I think a retelling, part of what makes a retelling is they um, are playing on what the folktale was doing. Like, um, well, so the Bear and the Nightingale retelling, quote unquote retelling, incorporates multiple folklores, and then they actually incorporate the elements that made that folktale what it was into the telling. But it's about more than that. Whereas I think an adaptation, you're trying to tell the same story. Whereas a retelling often is including it, <laughs> but not necessarily trying to accomplish the same thing as the original. I feel like uh, okay. retelling seems to imply that it's an older story, doesn't it? Yeah, there's that too. Yeah, kind of traditional. There's an adaptation. You're like uh, just adapting it for the modern setting. I guess. Yeah, that'd be another. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I I think I uh, see what you mean in a lot of. This is a retelling of this. This is a retelling of that. It's like. I think when you say retelling, what people. <laughs> Maybe what some people mean is that they they want to be the ones telling that story <laughs> in all the ways that they envision the story actually happening. Yeah. yeah. I like I guess adaptation. Yeah. Retelling also implies that it's the same story, doesn't it? To, at least mm -hmm. to some extent. Yeah, to some extent. Whereas it adaptation like it, yeah. could be, for example, the those Dorothy Must Die books you were you brought up earlier. Yes, Dorothy Must Die, which takes place um, much later than The Wizard of Oz and imagines if Dorothy didn't leave <laughs> and kind of um, really subverts a lot of expectations. I think that's the other thing, too, with the retellings is um, they're, they're playing with those the um, ideas in there, whereas an adaptation, I think too, adaptation gets, ends up being a really broad term too. Cause <laughs> I mean, Hercules is an adaptation of the myth, but <laughs> yeah. there's very little in there that is even remotely accurate <laughs> to mm. the original. Well, I, um, I mean, th there is a lot of stuff, like all the characters and the, roughly their connections are intact. Just a lot of the interesting nuances melted away. Well, no, because in Hercules, they take away who his mother is. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. And fair like enough. that's, that's part of what makes it all. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because the um, his mother, that's the other reason why it's called Hercules. His mother um, was a worshiper of Hera and thought that she was sleeping with um, one of Hera's uh, people when in reality she was she was sleeping with lovely lovely mr zeus <laughs> <laughs> the world's most so, famous adulterer yes <laughs> yes and it like and i think that's where it's an adaptation because they get the very beginning of it wrong <laughs> like mm. <laughs> um, whereas i think too like with retellings um and and that's where the urban fantasy examples are pretty good because they do take the character that's in those and put them in new situations, but the original stories of those characters, their historical, what they did historically, is still fully intact. Hmm. Um, yeah. They aren't trying to just bend the character into something they need. They take the character as is and apply it to their work. <laughs> Have you guys heard that the Lion King is basically just Hamlet. Oh, it is Hamlet. Everyone says that, yes. No, I um. haven't read Hamlet or seen it, so <laughs> I don't know. Sam, what do you it, think on that? Yeah, no, it's basically Hamlet. It is. Um, it's not a, tr again, it'd be a loose adaptation of it. 
because mm -hmm. it's missing a lot. But many of those characters, you can relate directly to it. And if I remember correctly, the whole his uncle killed his father is is pretty directly from <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> uh, the the big difference is the fact that um, in Hamlet he wasn't a child when his father died. Right. Um, mm. That was the big change that they had. Um, the, and, and the other thing too is that the morose bit when um, Simba is, you know, kind of like I don't know if depressed is the right word, but sad <laughs> about what happened with his dad, and you know he doesn't want to go and deal with it. That's very much Hamlet. Like mm. <laughs> Hamlet is a sad <coughs> character. Now, have you guys heard the the theory, which is my personal theory? So you probably haven't heard it unless you've heard someone else say the same thing. <laughs> Go on. That the Black Panther movie that came out is really just The Lion King. <laughs> adaptation of an really adaptation. Hamlet. Of an adaptation. <laughs> um, I can see where you're coming from. I can. Well, A lot of the story beats are like almost... Go ahead, make the argument. From... Okay. So, we start off with uh, a nation that is super prosperous. Uh, they have a good and just and wise king. And because of something that happened long ago with the king's kin, in, in this case, it was his, uh, it was his brother. Mm -hmm. But his brother is not the one who comes and takes revenge. His brother actually perishes before he gets that chance. Yes. <laughs> and so the 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 brother's son, who is um T'Challa's cousin, I guess you say. Um he comes back with a vengeance. And it, it's funny because um in, in this story, really Killmonger is more the driving force than our actual protagonist of T'Challa. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you almost have to tell the story from his perspective. Uh, you know, Killmonger, he becomes you know a fit and capable warrior, and then he goes back to Wakanda. <laughs> he goes back to Pride yep. Rock, yep. and uh, the king has passed away as well during you know a uh, civil war, and so it's just T'Challa, and he's about to become the king. Yeah, and he says, "Hey, Sarabi." <laughs> uh, <laughs> Killmonger says, "Hey, I have a right to the throne. Uh, it's very loose, but I bet I can beat you, and that won't matter." Yeah, and so T'Challa's like, "Well, uh, doesn't matter to me." Now, all of this is uh, basically uh, completely different from the Lion King, right? <laughs> You're making but, a good point. Yes. Uh, here's where the connections start to come in, is after this happens, now you have the expulsion from the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. um, just like uh, Simba, T'Challa was supposed to die when he ended up leaving the kingdom. Yeah. I mean, yes, Scar tells Simba, run away. But then he tells his hyenas to go, you know, kill him. <laughs> so... <laughs> He wasn't supposed to come back, you know. He was just—he was basically just keeping up the charade with Simba because uh, he was a bad person, but not a bad uncle. Uh, <laughs> I guess is the argument you can make for Scar. <laughs> um, Interesting. And uh, so both of the princes are now um, out of the kingdom. They are, you know, understandably pretty pretty dejected. They have had their self-worth questioned. Yeah. And now they have to go on a journey of discovery <laughs> to to accept the role of kingship. <clears throat> now, while the princes are away, the kingdom falls into rapid uh, uh, conflict and, and uh, pretty much just becomes all around worse yeah. uh, in Pride Rock. You had 
the hyenas were just, you know, eating up everything and uh, there wasn't enough food left for the lions. And, and somehow, some way, the whole area turned into like a desert. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But they killed all the herbivores and uh, the grass died as well. You would think the grass would start thriving, but well. Yeah, they so, disrupted uh, the circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> basically. But in uh, Black Panther, no, the grass, you know, Wakanda doesn't turn into the Sahara, but <laughs> at the same time, Killmonger is basically mandating that everybody prepare for war because yep. he's going to go uh, uh, claim revenge on certain ethnicities, I guess. And yep. he's also going to start arming other ethnicities, which is just, you know, that's just a bad I- political idea. I don't know why you would want to do that. It was, but, uh, it was funny when all the people, all the people who reviewed it, said how much they empathize with not only him but his goals. So oh. it's a little worrying. They're stupid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and if those are the same people who would criticize when America did the same thing with uh, Afghanistan. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the kingdom's in decline, right? Prince goes on a journey of self-discovery. He has to, some, to some degree, confront like the ghost of his father. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah. the ghost of his father convinces him that he's ready for this and that basically he just needs to you know, suck it up, buttercup, and <laughs> get back to the throne and don't let the whole kingdom, you know, don't let the whole kingdom fall because yeah. you took a hard knock, you know. Um, both of them involve a uh, a magic a fruit. Strong. <laughs> both of them do involve a magic fruit. Yes. Uh, I was I was thinking both of them involve a strong female lead, mm. who also uh, convinces the prince of his self worth. Now in yes. in the Lion King, that's just Nala, but in Black Panther, there's also. Um, uh, I don't remember his love interest name. Lupita yes, Nyong'o because is her real name. <laughs> she's barely a character in the sister, story. His sister was yeah. way more interesting. His, yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Is his sister was really more of a driving force. She was a lot more. You know, First time I watched it, I forgot that there was a love interest, and I was confused when they started talking <laughs> to each other. <laughs> I mean, guys, hey, technically Nala's probably Simba's sister, so. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. But okay, so also they're lions, so it doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> yeah. Well, and this is when I this is when I realized that they were the same movie, is that both of them involve a lone and seemingly magical tree in the middle <laughs> of like a plane. And this is where uh, Black Panther. Uh, meets his father. This is where Simba sees his father up in the clouds. And this is, you know, this mm. is the uh, <clears throat> this is the rising action. This is where uh, uh, everything is building up to the climax now. Because yeah. now our main hero has a purpose again and he can successfully fulfill the roles of the protagonist. So, boom. Time <laughs> to go back to the kingdom and <laughs> kick out this usurper. I... Uh, I wonder how many of the similarities are purely just because they're both based in kind of Saharan Africa or themed around it. <laughs> well, how many of them are based on the fact that they were both produced by the same company? I mean, uh, that might be it too, yes. You do have a point I think there. that's the idea. Disney said, look, we want to do a black superhero, <laughs> but we want to do it right. So it's got to, you know, it's got to be... He's gonna have to no character. He's gonna have no arc. He's gonna. <laughs> and then they were playing in the movie, and they're like, "Hey, we already did a movie about a king in Africa." <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, "Well, what are you talking about? Uh, the, the Lion King." And so they're like, "Oh, great, we'll just do that. <laughs> we mm. already made this movie. This is gonna be easy." <laughs> and then they made it again. <laughs> they made. So they told the same story three times and made a bunch of money off of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, the story concludes with, uh, and, and both of them, the hero doesn't kill 
um, the the opposing member, both <laughs> the villain get the villain gets themselves killed pretty much. Um, mm. And I mean, I mean, not really in Black Panther. <laughs> well, Black Panther. Uh, I will say that he did not intend to to. He stabbed a knife it's through his heart. Say, okay, yeah, no, it's better to say that he didn't really want to kill Killmonger. Sure, but it's sure. just kind of like the way that it had to be. Yeah. And as Killmonger was dying, you know, there wasn't no, there wasn't any animosity there. It's just like, well, shoot, I guess this is it. <laughs> uh, bury me over the ocean or whatever he said. Like, I'm not about to do a darn thing for you. You, know, <laughs> you tried to kill me. But, you know, um, with Simba, yeah. he was like, uh, you know, runaway Scar, never returned. And yeah. then Scar got killed by his own hyena. Yes. It's very ironic. So, you know, it, it's kind of just like their own, their own nature leads to their downfall. Mm. But, and then the king sits the throne and everything is just hunky-dory again. And we don't have any more problems to talk about. We don't need to talk about Simba's tax policy. Right, it's gonna... <laughs> All right, George. Or how all the magic be, flowers got let... destroyed. <laughs> we're just going to let everything be good. Mm. Yeah, there's no more magic flowers. There's going to be no more Black Panthers after you, T'Challa. Presumably. I was pretty sad about that. I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll find a way. <laughs> Yeah, well, on the topic of popular movies, do you guys have any opinions of... Oh, no. <laughs> it's it's related, though. There's a bunch of remakes that they've been doing about of popular movies recently, including The Lion King, but also things like Terminator. Uh, the first one that I remember uh, being made aware of was um, Total Recall, I think. But, uh, hmm. Well, Universal's been talking about um, redoing their famous monster movies. Mm, um, that too. Although I, I think they cancelled that when the Mummy one did really poorly. <laughs> no, no, no. They're doing it again. They're doing it again. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> They're making another Mummy? <laughs> Just go into the Scorpion King. Mm. They're all like... Cast the Rock they're again. they into the Scorpion King anyway. <laughs> yeah, they could get the Rock man. again, honestly. Oh, yeah. Invisible Man was the start of a new one called. Um, really, I thought that was yeah. just like a standalone thriller. No, no, because they've been talking about. Um, in fact, uh, come on, article, be useful to me. <laughs> um, yeah, because the Invisible Man was part of the original monster lineup for Universal. Yeah. Uh, and they're talking about um, Dark Army. Dark Army. Coming out too. It's an action film. Or it's a new one. Um, it's in the vein. Blah, 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 blah. What is? And uh, where is <laughs> Dark? Fine, Dark Army. Because it was all put on hold because of the pandemic. We will not speak of. Mm. <laughs> um. But let's see, Dark Army, what are you? Uh, it's a. Uh, be a bunch of the um, Universal monsters. That's why. It's not just one, yes. it's a few of them. Yes. Yeah. So, but yeah, Invisible Man, they said, was kind of the. They're, they're trying again, and they are. There are works for a new um, uh, Wolfman right. movie. Uh, and I a think new the Wolfman. new Wolfman. Yes. Oh, that's right. Ryan Gosling is in it. That's right. I think, like, when they make a new Wolfman, that's always the signal of, oh, they're trying to redo this again. Mm. Um, I I really enjoy the original Wolfman um, because if you if you go watch the original one, it's actually a much more kind of subtle movie than most monster movies are. Um, and it, yeah, but that's right, Ryan Gosling's in for the Wolfman. Very exciting. Am I the only one? I was thinking about this the other day. 
Mm. Am I the only one who's just not intimidated by a, a regular person-sized werewolf? <laughs> like, you can't be, you know... Well, what about a normal wolf? 5'10 and, and be a werewolf. And it's just like... A normal wolf is, like, almost as big as a horse. Wolves no. are huge. No. They some are. Wolves are. No, some I saw a are. wolf that was tall as a house. <laughs> what the? What, what tall as a house. Mean? This guy's doing a little bit of exaggerating, I think. I think so. Um, no. Hold on. But uh, wolves can get big, like, because uh, in the Northwoods, the wolves get very big. They get, you know, you're looking at 150, 175 pound wolves. But the common wolf is more like anywhere from, I think it's like, they have wolves down to 60 pounds up to like 100-ish pounds or maybe 115. Like they're not, they're big. They're not horse-sized wolves. Like they're not, they're, <laughs> See, they're big Those creatures. are what I call coyotes. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to trust the person with a wolf for their icon. <laughs> Look. I'm telling you, look at these pictures. Look at the picture I just shared. Uh, <laughs> gonna have to get this on regular, the screen now. How big is that girl? A regular walking through the woods, going about its business kind of wolf is as big as a person. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. said so we don't need people-sized werewolves because the regular wolves are already bigger right. than that. But that was my point. You said I wouldn't be scared of a person-sized werewolf, and so I asked. Would you be scared of a wolf? Because they're roughly person-sized. They are roughly person-sized. Now, I, I would be intimidated, I think, a little bit by a wolf. But I also, to some degree, know that I can I can fend off one wolf. Now, <laughs> you we, got a, we got a pack of wolves. That's different. Okay. But That's... a person-sized werewolf is just a man with untrimmed nails and fur. <laughs> I'll beat you up the same way I would beat up a regular guy. It's like was well, it's interesting. Course. Last night actually I watched an episode of uh, Love Death Robots which had uh werewolves as super soldiers in the army. And uh as as part of that they obviously have the the smell and the hearing and the sight, but also they have very quick regeneration and strength, things like that. That was a, actually a fairly interesting modern adaptation of werewolf stories. Hmm. What did you say it's called? Uh, the TV show. It's a series of animated uh, short f films called Love, Death, uh, Robots. They're, it's it's just uh, commas or something. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. It's pretty good, honestly. Although they, they do vary in length, which is annoying. <laughs> Can't fit them into my routine as well. Yeah. I, I think mm. a lot of the modern adaptations, they just... It's so annoying because they end up not really taking advantage of stuff that they're able to do. Yeah. Which is, is surprising given the budget of most of these films and uh, the number of people involved. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a more specific example? Um, let's see. Well, okay, yeah. The um, live a Disney adaptation of Beauty and the Beast. Right. It's kind of an easy shot to take, but... <laughs> mm. uh, it... I, I would say <laughs> it didn't do anything better than the original, and in fact, it, it kind of missed the mark on a lot of it. Um, mm. There is a review or critique I watched the nostalgia, the nostalgia critic. critic. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, I used to watch and those a lot. He, oh yeah. Well, and he he kind of summed it up best in that you in the live action, you don't have the build up to any of the emotions. So when the same scene happens, it just doesn't have the same impact. Mm. Um, and uh, that and then you you take. Like, you're missing the realization of when the beast realizes that, hey, this is a girl. She could maybe possibly 
break the spell? What do I need to do to make myself someone that she could fall in love with? Whereas in the modern adaptation, it's, oh, she's just a commoner. Oh, why would blah, blah, blah. It's like, what? Weird. <laughs> You, this, sh this, isn't, this isn't the point where you're realizing you did something wrong. It's not the point of Beauty and the Beast. The point of Beauty and the Beast is you have suffered your punishment. <laughs> this is a way for you to redeem yourself. Mm -hmm. Like the redemption yes. arc needs to start now, not the, <laughs> not the realization of the end of the punishment. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, the, whereas a great adaptation, um, especially when you, even when you compare it to the original novel, um, is the French adaptation that came out in, let's see, I think it was 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Could be more 2014, prepared. my bad, 2014, <laughs> um, which was filmed in France, is made by um, a French company and they hit a lot of notes just right. They hit the notes of the costumes feel very realistic. Um, mm. And it's a slow build, which makes sense for the story. Um, yeah. And it's just a lot more believable. Also, I still find it bothersome that Belle being a booky little girl is not unique enough. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she also has to be this slightly wacky inventor. And th that was one of the scenes that the critique critic had really pointed out was um, mm. there's a scene where, you know, someone destroys her washing machine and she doesn't really react. Right. Like, she just, you know, grabs it, puts it away, and then you don't really see her upset by it or anything. Mm. It just doesn't just feel slipped very it into the real. Movie. Yeah. 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 And... Um, the scene in the um, cartoon version where she's walking through the village and you have just all this animation going and they're able to convey, you're really able to get a sense of the personality of all these side characters yeah. through their animation, whereas in the live action you don't get that. And that's like, that's the other problem with like the live adaptation of the Disney Aladdin. Um, mm. I, I did enjoy that movie quite a bit, but Again, when you have the scene where he's running through Agrabah, you, you're missing all those little characterizations of all the side characters that you don't really see them again. They make, uh, you know, passing <laughs> cameos later on in the movie, but you get a sense of who those characters were, and they add that humor to it, to, mm. to the movie. Um, yes. And then, uh, but for, like, Beauty and the Beast retellings, though, um, I usually like the retellings where movies, I like it when they're kind of close to the original. Um, and you don't, I think in a movie, because you have the visual aspects, you can build up a lot of, like, what is dead space by what the actors are doing, by the ambience, by, you know, watching their facial expressions. Yeah. Whereas in a book, you have a lot more work to do. You can't. <laughs> mm, yeah. You can't imply things as much. Um, so, <laughs> to do Beauty and the Beast well, all of those downtimes that in the movie they're able to kind of gloss over a little bit and just focus on the main bits. In the book retellings, all the little things are what adds up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of Beauty and the Beast retellings. Um, one of the ones that you guys maybe would be remember is um, Beastly. It nope. turned into a movie <laughs> back in like 2010. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I actually, I read that book. Yeah, it's a good book. I didn't watch the movie because this, this, uh, the cover that they had for it it's just god awful, <laughs> and I'm sending. I'm showing it to you guys now. It's, it's who came up with that? <laughs> it looks so bad. Yeah. Um, it yeah. looks like he's got the shadow yeah, of like look some like... vines over him or something, like yeah. trees or something. Yep, that is exactly what 
it ends up looking like. Um, oh, it I'm wasn't, a monster. You're it a guy with tattoos. It wasn't, actually wasn't that bad of an adaptation. Um, <laughs> where, it, where it fell through was, again, building that relationship. And it missed all the sweet scenes between the two of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. But as far as like a movie on as a whole, I think part of the reason why I didn't do very well is <laughs> it, it it played slow. It was kind of a slow movie where really if they'd focus on the action of it and really um, ramped up the, the mild humor that's bet- between the two characters, it would have been very good. It would have been well done. So do you guys know there's a Disney movie out there that not a whole lot of people talk about that has a bunch of books and a bunch of adaptations? Simba. You guys got something coming. Simba. It's you Simba gotta give me you book. gotta give me a title there. That, that like Oh, I meant that Simba. Sorry. Not very helpful. Uh, Iron okay, Man. Well, I'll just tell you. Tarzan. Yeah. Okay, Tarzan is not a Disney thing. Tarzan is a novel series written by... It's a very old Tarzan. I, mm-hmm. That's what I just said. I know that. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I said it has a bunch of books, not like Disney books. No, Tarzan okay. has been out forever. Okay, but, yeah, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs. He... If, we include, <laughs> if we include The Lion King as Macbeth, then pretty much all of the Disney stuff... Uh, at, at the time, was was adapted from something, right? Everything oh, they yeah. have is adapted sure. from something. When it comes, at least when it comes to their animated yeah. stuff. Uh, no, Tarzan actually was very, very popular and has had so many remakes. And I think it's just the modern day; it, it's kind of fallen out of popularity. I mean, the Tarzan novels were getting published well into the '60s. You have black and white movies. You have. Um, st- an insane amount of stuff for the Tarzan series, uh, <laughs> but it's a it's. I think that's one of those the modern. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of modern movies. The last one you have is um, with Alexander Skarsgård, which was great. I enjoyed that a lot because it was yeah. very accurate was to a very good movie. A novel character, um, but oh no, don't get me started on Tarzan because there are some very good adaptations of it, and it's just. Um, well, that's the thing is that, you know, I, I think that uh, when you have an adaptation or when you have a, even if you were to do a retelling, you know, lots of times nobody wants to do those in the original setting, right? <laughs> so you have, you know, a, a relatively, uh, I mean, it's a somewhat compelling love story with Tarzan, right? But for the most part, it falls apart once you once you start thinking about it realistically, and then you have like the sort of setting of the jungle, and you have the the near superhuman uh, character of Tarzan himself. <laughs> I think that it just you have two aspects there: the love story and the superhuman uh, abilities of Tarzan. And I think that the reason people don't really care about Tarzan is because it takes place in a jungle as opposed to something a bit more refined, like a castle in Beauty and the Beast or like an enchanted forest in, you know, uh, uh, Sleeping Beauty. See, I would argue more so that the reason maybe it's not as popular in modern culture is um, it, it really is a very kind of aggressive series where it is about his strength, it is about a lot of that in modern culture a lot of times pushes away from that Um, and I think the other thing too is that part of the reason I think it has gone out of style if you would it's about you know a a adult man who was raised by wild creatures and in this version you know he becomes a, he's able to become a modern citizen of the time, um, but the real life examples don't work out that way. Um, oh, my, who's thinking about it on that level? 
<laughs> well, is that a common but, thought? But well, that and then also it's this is a series, right? That is at this point the first one was published over a hundred years ago, but it's never required reading. It's not unless you enjoy um, reading classic literature, because I think Tarzan. It's Edgar Rice Burroughs. It ends up falling into that classic literature. But because it is much more of an entertainment series, it doesn't get the attention that it once did. Like the other really famous one, famous series by Edgar Rice Burroughs is the um, Mars series, right? The Princess of Mars, Gods of Mars, um, the one that Ron Carter, the movie, yeah. was um, based on. Right, uh, and that book series has always been very popular um, because it it is used sometimes as reference material or as um, well. John Carter, I think, gets at least some credit for influencing modern science fiction novels. I mean, Tarzan series isn't. It's kind of a unique series in that it's based on this one idea of a wild child, um, mm. but doesn't necessarily influence any other stories that aren't based around that. And it's not a common story plot, really. Mm. Well, um, if I'm not it, wrong, Tarzan is currently in the public domain. It is. Mm, that would explain why they're not pushing it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> It's oh, I love the Tarzan books. They are so well written. Edgar Allan Burroughs is a fantastic author. Um, mm. I I just think he does Edgar such Rice a good Burroughs. job. <laughs> I think part of it too is I grew up like my dad was a big fan of Tarzan, so I grew up watching the Tarzan movies. Um, and the other one that I loved was a series. Uh, based on the Caspian series, which is the land that time forgot, um, the people that time forgot, and out of time's abyss, where the idea is that there is this um, world within the Earth's crust, right, that is still yeah. stuck in yeah. the past. Um, and they made a series about it, uh, the, a live action series. Ugh. Why, why is my brain not working? But yeah, I think um, part of the reason why I know it is because I was exposed to all of that and I really enjoyed it. Um trying to find yeah. what the T V series was that was based on. I saw the movie with uh The Rock. Yes. Yeah, that and was that was a thing that happened. <laughs> didn't they do another movie that had Will Ferrell? Yes. He was like in the same sort of situation. That, I, um, that movie was funny. <laughs> oh my goodness. But um, very similar yeah. to Jumanji, actually. So, what make what make certain stories sort of worthy of a retelling? I mean, obviously, we can just say, "Oh, they were influential to someone who wanted to, you know, later become a writer, and then they did a retelling." But when you have something like Beauty and the Beast, you know, a tale as old as time. Well, is it really a tale as old as time? Is that what it takes? I mean, uh, I think, we I still think have jungles. <laughs> jungles are as old as time. I think part of it is, like, for um, Beauty and the Beast, Beauty and the Beast, and there's an adaptation called Making Faces, and I'll, I will share this cover for to put up. Tam knows, like, 17 <laughs> adaptations of Beauty and the Beast. I own like 17 adaptations of <laughs> <laughs> Beauty and the Beast. Come on now. Uh, um, but Making Faces by Amy Harmon um, is a modern example of Beauty and the Beast. And, and I think it, it actually does a good job of capturing why this story keeps becoming a thing because Making Faces, there is no magic involved. Um, it is set a few after few years after um, 9/11, and mm. it's about two characters. One character is the 
daughter of the local, small, son of small town, local grocer, um, and she works at the grocery store, and she stayed in her town to help her dad. You know, she stayed back to do that for him, even though she has all this potential to become an author, of all things. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the main leading man, our beast, Ambrose, um, isn't, he, he wasn't, you know, spelled by magic. He was in the war zone, and his convoy hit an IED, and he was the only one of his, of his group of four guys from this small town who came back. Um, and then half of his body is completely scarred up permanently because of the IED. Uh, he lost his ear, he's missing hair on half of his head, um, just completely scarred up. And it follows the two of them as, you know, the innocent beauty who's always stayed in her hometown, who was kind of like the miracle of child for her parents because they had her when they were very old. And you also have um, her cousin, who is the other reason why she stayed back, because he has, I believe, cerebral palsy, and she helps care for him. Um, but you have a story of the Beast isn't a bad guy. Ambrose isn't a bad man, but he's gone through a lot of stuff and he needs the beauty to show him that life is still worth living. Mm. Um, and I think that's where Beauty and the Beast is constantly retold because there's just something about it that echoes of real life. Even with the magic, there's something real about opposites hmm. and, and kind of going beyond what someone looks like to their actual character. Highly recommend yeah. Making Faces, by the way. Such a good book. It's You guys, though, it's sad. It's super sad. It's so sad. <laughs> like, mm. it's, uh, it's really, really good, but um, everyone I've given it to has cried at one point, one specific point in the book. Right. So... <laughs> Well, we've we've got another book that we've been recommended by you that we should probably finish first. Should we yeah. should we make a promise of when we want to finish that by, or or not? <laughs> Rob, that's kind of up to the two oh. of you. Oh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I didn't know you were talking. Um, I don't know. I started out with enthusiasm, but yeah. then I heard grandma, and I'm just like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to actually read it now. I can't get the audio book. And, uh, yeah. let's, let's say two weeks. Two weeks, sure. It's so um, actually my main definitely. criticism of it so far is that it's not very like enticing to read. There's no, there's no real hooks that will make me want to continue reading. The actual quality is mm. fine enough <laughs> well we were I, warned yep, <laughs> i gave you an option either a bad one or one that i thought you would actually like and you guys i'm pretty bad. sure i said what i would like but rob said it louder so. <laughs> <laughs> i said it was more enthusiastic mm. um no, so jake what, what do you think about um specifically <laughs> talking about like that sort of fairy tale kind of story. What makes it so compelling to people throughout the ages that it just keeps coming back again and again? Oh, well, I th uh, we actually talked about this a while ago, I think. But uh, my my main theory is that... Talk about it on camera. Indeed. Well, it's still not on camera, but whatever. The, no my main theory is that... Uh, it's it's difficult for humans to like remember and understand and tell information in you know accurate very specific ways and what we we've evolved to or whatever you want to say it uh, the the best way that for us to tell give information is in the form of a story you know this type of person so you can decide whether it applies to you or not did this type of action and this was the consequence you know that's that's the preferred method of us receiving information. And so uh, my theory is that 
stories, uh, I, I, a lot of people share the same idea, but the idea is that stories have first evolved to just transfer information to each other, as we were noting, some, a lot of the, the popular folk stories are have simple messages in them, like don't mess around with strangers, you know, don't wander into the woods, those kind of things. And then over the years, they've shifted more and more towards the, the entertainment side. Although I would say most of the really excellent stories that people still love still convey important information of some form or another. Okay. <laughs> so we hear Sam talk about uh, Beauty and the Beast a lot. Mm. What, oh, yeah. What's a really impactful sort of story like that to you? To me. <laughs> Ooh, okay, yeah. actually, can I, I, Rob, can I reword your question? And this will um, apply to you too. Is there um, a retelling style, or, or not style, but a um, story who you enjoy reading the retellings of it? Hmm. Well, as I was pointing out through this, I have read a lot of just re reinterpreted versions of classic folktales that I've enjoyed a lot. But I, I wouldn't say any specifically, uh, you know, come to mind as my favorite or uh, being particularly impactful to me. Yeah, I, I think I'm in a similar boat. I mm. never really got um, like a lesson from the stories to where it's just like, yeah. oh, I, I love to see, you know, this particular story packaged up in different ways and told in different ways. Right. However... There is definitely, going again back to that Greek mythology, that particular subject matter is always interesting to me because in there, there's still lessons in there. Usually, uh, we all know by now that Greek mythology is, uh, uh, lots of it is based on some sort of like core, um, typically a negative aspect of humanity, like uh, greed, or um, the the uh, obsession with like knowing the future or something like that. Mm. And while we were talking about this earlier, it came to my mind that there was a Hercules movie that starred The Rock uh, a few years back. And me being as into Greek mythology as I was, of course, I watched it, and I super super loved it uh, and the reason that I loved it was just because mm. <laughs> it did Hercules in a way that nobody else had done it right and this kind of goes the, the reason that this links into your question Sam is because I guess I like a retelling that legitimately puts a fresh spin on it yes but also makes you think about the story in a way that you hadn't thought about it before. So mm. with this Hercules, kind of one of the core aspects of it is that it's, it's treated as a mythology that could, that, that may or may not be real. At mm. several points throughout the movie, they'll talk about the things that Hercules has done and they'll talk about them like they're real. <laughs> but then later on, you know, when it's just Hercules talking with his, his uh, mercenary company, it's, it's like you find out that they were, they were maybe not as true as what people were saying. Like um, Hercules slaying the Hydra. Yeah. Well, turns out it was just a couple of snakes or something like that, a couple of really big snakes. <laughs> or, you know... Um, when Hercules killed the uh, the Nemean lion, yeah, uh, it was just like a fake or something like that, and you know it, it kind of cropped up with the idea that there's like all of these uh, myths surrounding Hercules who is living, you know, he's he's here and he's present in this particular story, and even still he's got like this celebrity status about him, to where people don't don't really question like what could be true. They see Hercules, he's huge, he's a good fighter. So if he says he, he killed a big lion, well, 
he's wearing a big lion on his head, you know, so I, he must have did it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and it culminated in such a satisfying way because it still keeps that original idea of Hercules um, killing his own family. Now, for the majority of the story, Hercules is under the idea that it was the um, Cerberus or Kerberos, however you want to say it, that actually Cerberus, fought saying. his family. But yeah. what, but what gets revealed is that the main villain, who is actually not Hera in this movie, um, the main villain like basically drugged Hercules and made him think that he was fighting the three-headed uh, dog Cerberus. But actually, he was just brutally massacring his family. <laughs> and uh, amazing. At the end of the story, basically all of the myths have been unraveled, and you're left wondering, okay, well, what is Hercules if not just basically a really strong con man? <laughs> um, well, that's when they have him do something legitimately superhuman. And it throws everything else back into question, you know? It's yeah. like, okay, well, maybe you really did, uh, you know, fight some sort of mythical monster, or maybe you are legitimately, like, you know, blessed with, with uh, superhuman strength. And it was and just such a good movie. Don't forget, in that movie, they did have a nymph, or a couple of nymphs, because I know the one you're talking about. It's a very good one. It was, um, I think it was the My Canadian group. Uh, it was really good. They did have nymphs in it. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't quite remember the nymphs. They, not saying um, that they're not was, there. I just, uh, it's been um, a while. It was since I've his seen love interest that wasn't his wife. Ah, yeah. and uh, there was that guy, um, played by Ian McShane. Can't remember his actual name, but y you know, if you if you've seen the movie, then you know what I'm talking about. How he goes like the whole movie, like waiting to die, and uh. It never happens, and then he gets nope. his moment, and Hercules ruins it. <laughs> He's like, "No, you can't die yet. I kind of need you still." But it's just like they—they play with the idea of like um, that sort of like mythological aspects and divine action all throughout the movie, and they do it in such a way to where you never really know whether or not it's real. Or, or how far it can go, like what, what it's capable of. And so yeah. it's kind of, it just puts you on the edge of your seat, like you're waiting to see something uh, magical, and then you don't get it, but you don't feel disappointed because that's kind of like the theme of the movie. <laughs> so I actually looked it up. I am not thinking of the same Hercules film that you were talking about because you're talking about the one with The Rock. Yeah, did you see the one with that other guy? I saw the other one, but the plot lines are so similar to how they <laughs> how they deal with the myths. I'm a little thrown right now. I'm mm. a little I, confused. I didn't watch the other one. I know they came out at almost the same time, but I didn't watch that one because I saw it got really bad reviews. And I was like, well, I'll just watch <laughs> the one that has the rock in it because I know I'll like it. <laughs> Because in that one, didn't they have Hercules as like a gladiator or something? Yeah, no, I'm I'm actually thinking about one that came out in like 2010-ish, I think is when it was. Oh, there's um. another one. <laughs> well, we, we co could talk about this more, but uh, I feel like we've been going for quite a while. And it might be a good time to stop the recording at the very least. Yes. <laughs> Um, oh wait, are you thinking of Immortals, Sam? <laughs> no, <laughs> Not no, it's wrong. an actual. Hold on, let me. Because Immortals was it. Steve here. It's it's a TV <laughs> film. Um. Uh. Um. Yeah, we we can resolve this and then yep. call it. But uh, so just to kind of summarize. We like retelling <laughs> that, uh, well, you go ahead and say what you said, Sam, because you, you said quite a bit. Hmm? <laughs> he wants to, you to sum up <laughs> the podcast. Ah, so we had 
the discussion about uh, folk tales, what, what makes a folk tale, um, re what makes a retelling versus an adaptation, and uh, a discussion of why we think certain stories get adapt far more adaptations than other folk tales, and why in some folk tales that we ourselves quite enjoyed and modern adaptations that we either enjoyed or did not enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> So, I think that, is that the summation you were looking for? <laughs> I was looking for a, a more, I guess you could say, personal to you, what you like to see in a retelling. Oh, I, I enjoy seeing a retelling that is well written and takes the original story and tells it in such a way that I could believe this could actually happen. Mm. So, I would say either that or accurate to how it was originally for the historical value. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can get down with all of that. Mm. And then to add in my own, I, I like one that makes you think about it in a way that you haven't seen it before or haven't thought about it before. Mm. I mean, awesome. well, you can't really, you can't really, I'm going to make this way, this movie in a way no one's thought about it before, but you can say in a way that it hasn't maybe uh, been presented as commonly. <laughs> uh, just because you, you can't really control what people think. I mean, that's like, you know. Yeah. I'm going to make Hercules in a way nobody has thought about it before. Well, are you going to make Hercules in space or something? Because, you know, people have. Some I'm pretty, pretty wild sure Hercules imaginations. in space has probably been included in some. Uh, almost, sure. certainly, <laughs> almost certainly. Almost certainly. Hercules in space. I'm gonna Google it. We'll see. Well, that's a that's a fun place to end it. Uh, Sam, do you wanna do the outro? Because if I, I do it, I just do a writing excuses ripoff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, terrible. Well, that is all we have for today. Um, Please follow us, subscribe, leave a review, comment, hit that like button, hit <laughs> that ring bell, do all of the things. Uh, and Thank you for some listening for an hour and 45 minutes, if anybody did. Uh, oh, yeah. Good. Congrats. Good job for making it all this way. Somebody will. A at Somebody. least I will. <laughs> Good job. No, we had a couple people last time who, read the, who listened to the whole thing. So Nice. Well, thank you to those people and Rob. Hi, from the past. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, me. <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Bye. bye.